Ah, nothing like a nice cup of joe on a dark, cold, rainy night to- You do know you're not done yet, right? I'd prefer the third degree burns I'm experiencing right now! You don't have any skin, how are you getting third degree burns? So as my friend and co-op partner Tricky Fox alluded to, this is actually a sequel to one of my previous commentary videos. Our response to Totally Not Mark and his friend Tom. But this time they are not talking about character design, but rather game design. And while you can't chalk up the last video to be steeped in more opinionated leanings, there are more issues that can be pointed out with their logic in this one. Just to clarify, Totally Not Mark did respond to my previous video on him. He was a good sport, and acknowledged that some of the faults within his own video. I do want to be open and upfront on that, and show that I do know that he's there, and he's willing to listen to criticism. And that I wish nothing for the best of him. He owns up to his mistakes, and his reply is pretty good. I respect that. We are still gonna rip this video in two though, right? Oh, hell yeah! With those simple mechanics, there's actually an awful lot going on under the hood. Yeah, you've got stab bonuses, EVs, IVs, QVs, abilities, held items, weather conditions, Z moves, extra, status effects. I mean, I just made some of those up right now, and you didn't even notice. That's how goddamn convoluted this shit gets. Oh, so you're aware of Z moves? <laughs> oh boy. Someone gets a pen at cell ready! But, with an audience of everyone on this our lord's flat earth in mind, Nintendo have designed the series so that there's a little something for everyone. The combat is simple to grasp, yet difficult to fully comprehend, and there's this whole gotta catch em all angle that's so popular, the app that no one plays anymore still makes 1.8 billion beans a year somehow. Now, just to lay all the Pokemon cards out on the table here, I've been playing these games since before I could read. I've completed the Pokedex in every single game from Red and Blue all the way to Sun and Moon, as well as bred and trained a competitive team. <laughs> This'll be really fun to look at then, considering what you'll neglect to bring up later. Here are the top 8 trainers and their teams in last year's North American International Championships. So, of 48 possible Pokémon that could have appeared, only 26 different Pokémon were used. 71% of those 26 appeared on two or more teams, just 29% appeared only once. That's less than a third of unique Pokémons. I mean, that's kind of obvious, no one's gonna want to take any of the pre-evolved Pokémon to a competitive match since they haven't gotten the best stats yet. Not that big of a shocker that most of the roster wouldn't be used since they aren't fully developed as Pokémon. But Kevin, don't you know that pre-evolved Pokémon can be just as dangerous? What? What makes you say- That's what the enemy taught me. That does not count! And, might I add, not a single woman of color among them. So. I mean, I'm not saying anything, but, uh, the numbers don't lie. Cards on the table, I know this is a joke, but Tabu Lele is literally a feminine Pokemon with black skin. Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I'm really bad at math, so I got my brother to do all that. But, like, he's an what? asshole and could just be fucking with me. I have literally no way of telling. Look, the point I'm trying to make is that of over 800 guys to choose from, it's really only viable to use a mix of the same 30 or so. Well, that's competitive metagaming for you. What about it? It's not just Pokemon that has to deal with that shit. Pretty much every competitive game has problems like this. And you kind of forget to mention that the Pokemon meta is always evolving. Every new game in the series shakes things up and any slight change to a Pokemon, like an updated move pool, mega evolution, hidden ability, or even just a new held item can make a Pokemon viable. And actually, no, it's not really viable. In fact, if we look towards the past competition, we've seen people use Pachirisu in order to make become the champion. The problem isn't due to viability, it's how people are just finding what works. This doesn't take into account the skill of the player. I mean, looking at the roster of the champion, Jeremy Rodriguez, he uses Driplim, a Pokemon that is often considered PU by Smogon standards. <laughs> oh, come on! Huh, I fox I only kidnap children. Are you calling me old? Even if you're using one of the less common ones, it still just looks like you copied some other kid's homework and <laughs> changed it slightly so it didn't look obvious. That's kind of just the nature of stat-based RPGs. There's often an objectively optimal build to follow, and people will figure out what it is and jump through all kinds of hoops to make sure they have the best character possible. 
That's not really the case for stat RPGs, more likely for competitions. It's the same thing in other forms of meta, like Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic the Gathering. People will use cards that are obviously great to use in tandem with each other. And Pokemon isn't as cut and dry as you make it, because again, looking at towards the Pokemon like Drifflim in your example of Charizard here, I can actually see quite a difference in how the Pokemon can be used. The Charizard with Tailwind could be more than likely used as a setup Pokemon since Tailwind is a great support move. Meanwhile, the other Charizard is used as a powerhouse since when it's used with its Mega Evolution form, it'll have access to a turn 1 solar beam. Subtle differences like that can easily change how Pokemon's role on a team can be. By the way, can you tell me what competitive gaming has to do with the stagnation of the franchise, especially when you consider that the meta is changing with each generation? <laughs> Originally, a Pokemon's EVs and IV stats were kept hidden from the player. The reason they even existed in the first place was to make sure each Pokemon was unique. For example, if you and a friend both picked Charmander at the start of your games, by the time they both evolved into Charizard, they would have drastically different stats to each other, even if they were both on the same level. Now, of course, once people figured this out, it had the exact opposite effect. Now people wouldn't have unique Pokemon, they would instead spend hours specifically breeding and training them to have the best relevant stats possible. And does doesn't that sound like a fun game for kids? Not everyone does it for competition's sake, there's still the player base that just plays the game for the sake of the RPG elements. You guys already bought up the gotta catch em all aspect of it, so to make this claim that people would go out of their way to just follow the tier list wouldn't make a lot of sense. Nothing else is needed to beat the Pokemon League or to complete the Pokedex, which most people would consider the goals of the game. The competitive scene is a whole different beast altogether. In fact, for argument's sake, if people did actually just care for that aspect of Pokemon, why are there so many fan games that don't take the competitive aspect into account for them. Or are you telling us that you cannot enjoy a game for its single player campaign when it has a competitive scene? Hey, Mark, you hear this? Oh, that's the sound of progress, baby. Mm. Mm. Oh my god, I just spilled it all down my shirt. Eventually, Nintendo added ways to make the whole ordeal feel less like a felony, with things like super training and other examples, probably. But there's still a lot of tedious bullshit to do just to get your foot in the door. Oh uh, yeah, super training. You know, the system that was kicked out after Generation 6 for a much more viable and less tedious system? Doesn't even touch on things like vitamins or the power held items. You can buy stat boosting items like iron or calcium since Generation 1. While it didn't properly explain how effort values work in those games, it does show that the stat customization has been an intended feature from the very beginning to some degree and they don't just hand it out to the player. Plus, for someone who's a heartfelt story about how my Eevee evolved into a brand new Pokemon... But then one time when I was playing Pokemon Silver, my Eevee evolved into an Umbreon all by himself. And I thought that my love for my Eevee had literally created a new Pokemon. And he's been my favorite ever since. You know that if Game Freak cut out the RPG elements, that would be really detrimental to the series since you wouldn't have that memory of yours. Imagine if in Smash you couldn't just pick a character. No, 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 no. First, you gotta go online and research what movesets and shit work best. Then, spend god knows how long breeding a version of that character who's competitively viable. Then, spend two fucking hours playing some dumbass, mindless minigames so the character's stats are up to par. Yeah, you see, this is the part of the video that confuses me. Why are you focusing on super training? You bring up the competition from last year, but last time I checked, Sun, Moon, Ultra Sun, and Ultra Moon don't have the super training system. It bows me why you keep referencing the super training when the latest games on the headhound systems have given a much more efficient method of EV training and dealing with the IV system as well, but more on that later. Then, train her up to level 100, and then you can start playing the... Actually, level 50 is the minimum requirement. Now, there is a good reason to level your Pokémon up to level 100, but they don't actually bring up the reason in this video. In fact, they ignore it to push a narrator. Jesus, are you done? You fucking wish, weeb. Try doing that five what? more times. Now, or you know, you could use the Poke Palago and train up to 18 Pokemon's EVs at a time. Or you could just do none of that and instead play Pokemon Showdown and choose exactly what you want in less than five minutes for free. Oh, you're gonna be a jerk about this, aren't you? Oh, you betcha. I mean, I can't think of a single reason to grind out 40 plus hours in a game you spend 50 squids on where you can just do. This for zero squid. Very gross generalization, and love how you're ignoring the whole, you know, story, collectathon, RPG elements to your purchase. No, 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 you're only paying 50 bucks to compete in a tournament. What is this, Overwatch?
Of course, that leaves Pokemon in the awkward position where if you're into the competitive battling, it's actually a better option to just not buy the game. That's not a great place for your series to be. And while I do have a few ideas on how to fix it, nothing really without working the entire battle system, which would make trading Pokemon between generations a fucking nightmare. So let's just work with what we got. Yes, you can do that, but I'm pretty sure that you still need a game cartridge if you want to participate in any official tournament. And for Christ's sake, what is wrong with training your Pokemon? They are called effort values for a reason, because they require effort. There's already an option to get the best possible version of your Pokemon in minutes, so that's what we're competing with. And while the super training is a nice gesture, all it really does is reduce the 10 hours of tedious bullshit to two hours of tedious bullshit. It needs to be at least as simple as this. So just give people a menu where they can customize their EVs at will. Digimon World had a gym area in the second screen of that game that basically allowed you to do the exact same thing, and it was super satisfying. You know, I googled it out of curiosity, and the training in Digimon World is not nearly as simple as you describe it. You still need to invest time, you can only train that many status swans, there are several factors that determine how fast your Digimon trains. It is still far more complicated and time consuming than a slider. Honestly, as someone who's played the games as a kid, and this is totally anecdotal, but I hated doing that. It was so boring. I still have my copies of the game, and it's still just as tedious, if not more so. Why? Because there are multiple gyms. You need to have certain items to make the training the most effective, like the Super Carrot. Digimon World 3 was pretty good, though. 2 is better, in my opinion. <laughs> they never released that one in Europe, asshole. Oh! <laughs> You're already halfway there with super training. Now you just gotta fully commit to the bit. Subscribe, please. <laughs> You could also have a method unlocked after you beat the league to IB train your Pokemon. Okay, tell me exactly why Game Freak should install a system that allows you to adjust the EVs of your Pokemon for nothing at all. It's convenient for the player, obviously, but Pokemon is an RPG centered around catching and training monsters. If you want a perfectly trained Charizard, you gotta work for it. And really, it's not nearly as bad as you make it out to be. You completely ignore stat boosting items that you can buy on mass to directly increase the ones that you want even if you can't max out any stat with those alone. But it still saves you a lot of time. In addition to that, Pokemon Sun and Moon features a Pokepelago Isle Evil Up, which allows you to max out a set of any Pokemon by not playing the game. It takes you about 30 hours to max out a set for one Pokemon. This may sound like a lot, but you can do it for up to 18 Pokemon at once and you can just turn off your 3DS and do something else as it is an automatic process. You can even cut it down to 15 hours by using some Poke Beans. Lazy enough for ya? Not to mention, there is a method for IV training your Pokemon after you beat the league. It's called Hyper Training, which allows you to modify the stats of a Pokemon. In fact, it can actually be better than just the IV modifier since the move Hidden Power, a rather key move that for many Pokemon, can benefit from the training since it makes the IV simulate being at max while keeping the actual number. Now, Hyper Training is instantaneous, but it requires items to use. Bottle caps. And buying a bottle of water for that one security guard with a sore throat won't cut it. Here's a bit of a point to be made that it is a bit tedious to get those bottle caps, but considering that you can get them for nothing by using the Pokepelago, or as a reward for fighting in the battle tree, I think that's pretty reasonable. Again, if you want to max out your character in an RPG, I don't see why it shouldn't require at least a little bit of effort, and what the game is asking for is not that unreasonable. <laughs> Now I can push the stats of my Jigglypuff. Now, with all that nerd shit out of the way, I want to talk about something a little more artsy fartsy. Let's play Spot the Difference. Here's some gameplay from 2013's Pokemon X and Y. And now, here's some gameplay from 2016's Sun and Moon. Notice anything? They're the same picture. Actually, no, they're not, mainly because you're cherry-picking. I mean, I could point out the fact that Sun and Moon's backgrounds have a bit more life to them. They're not just static images, but Sun and Moon and Ultra Sun and Moon had dynamic cameras going on. Meaning, as you operate during the battle system, the cameras would actually move around the Pokémon. Pokémon has been using practically the exact same presentation for almost two decades. Fuck it, even the pulse screens are the same. Generations 1, 2, 3, 4? Are you seeing a pattern yet? 
Yeah, that one was broken a long time ago. Generation 4, Generation 5, Generation 7. They've changed the pause menus! Greatly! Not to mention that it is now designed to be navigated on the touchscreen. What, what do you want? Also, have you ever paused the game in Pokemon Let's Go? <laughs> Look at the difference between Ruby and Sapphire and Pokemon Coliseum, which came out one year later. This is what people wanted with the jump from handheld to home console. Now look at the difference between Sun and Moon and the upcoming Switch games. There it is! Completely ignoring the camera angles there in Pokemon Sun and Moon and Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon that are doing the exact same thing as in Coliseum. Don't believe me? Here you go again! Not to mention that we don't really know how the battles will look like in Shields and Sword. At the time of writing this video, we don't know how the menus will look like either. We don't know how the camera will work during combat. We only see some standard angles in the review trailer and we don't even get to see the battle menus. So I think you're jumping the gun a little bit here. Look, I get that we gamer girls are a simple species. We don't like change. The words loot box ignites a primal fear in our hearts and we outright refuse to stop buying Skyrim. But for the love of God, if we can't change gameplay, can we at least get a little more style going on here? There is more style, not Pokemon's fault that you're clearly ignoring the changes that the games are making to present this bogus argument. Something with a bit of funk? Something like... Oh, Metal no, Gear Stop! No, I'm fucking with you. Uh, something like... Oh, don't you dare do what I think you're going to... You never see it coming! What is life? if not pain and suffering. Look, ideally you could revamp the whole system and have everyone entirely animated and moving around between attacks. But as of the release of this video, there are currently one million different Pokemon. One million and three if you count the newly revealed starters. So setting aside a budget for unique contextual animation for each of them, I think is money best spent elsewhere. Funny that you mentioned unique animations. Why the main characters in Persona 5 have reverse stylish attack animations, when they are using their personas, they have one Joker grabs on his mask and the enemy gets hit with a fireball, a thunderbolt, or whatever. The personas themselves have an idle animation and an attack animation and that's about it. And the all-out attack is pretty much the same every time. And if you want to compare Pokemon to Persona, you should compare the mons, not the humans. PERSONA! Like I'm one of those men in black memory eraser thingies to use on the design team. Maybe that way Sugimori and co will stop designing Pokemon to look like reanimated plushies that sprung forth from a bucket of unicorn shit. Mark, your video on Pokemon designs was garbage. Shameless plug to other video. After having Persona 5 exposed to my eyeballs for more than 30 seconds, I don't think I can go back to four colored boxes and an idle animation. So yes, let's just ignore the fact that Persona 5 also has idle animations in their games. Let's ignore the fact that Pokemon Sun and Moon and Ultra Moon have a moving camera as well as the Z moves that are a bit more flair to the attacks especially considering the custom Z moves for specific Pokemon. Let's ignore that you're comparing the PS4, PS3 title to a handheld title. Let's ignore that you're clearly cherry picking what footage to show your audience. Let's talk about the fact that we don't know what the Switch games UI will be like. And you're assuming way too much based on the stuff you guys are clearly using in your bias to decide what is and isn't relevant to your argument. Not so much that you guys completely ignore Pokemon Let's Go, Eevee and Pikachu. You might consider them a spin-off, but it mostly plays like a mainline title, so I think it is worth discussing. And as it turns out, it looks much different than the handheld games. Everything about that game oozes with style. Going to the hospital, Persona, okay. Which one? Pokemon. Winning a battle, Persona, Pokemon. Fuck it, like Mark was saying, pausing the game, Persona, Pokemon. And your example for the Pokemon pause screens is again picked from the older generations and ignoring the clear island theme that it has going on for the island game. I will never understand why they went back to that annoying alarm sound after Generation 5. I don't know, probably for the same reason why they decided to go back to the older formulas for things. Because people complained about Generation 5. A lot. But that's just a theory. I mean, I'm okay with things staying the same throughout a series, but this isn't the same. It's stagnant. Yes. And they've tried mixing things up with things like Mega Evolutions and this monstrosity, but it's always been to the detriment of other aspects. I mean, look at how many new Pokemon have been added to the later entries compared to previous titles. 
Yeah, let's just ignore the fact that they made a pretty sudden jump from 2D to 3D with not just Pokemon assets, but assets for the environment, characters, and who knows what else. I, I said this before and I'll say it again, just because there's a lower amount of Pokemon in a roster, that doesn't mean anything about the quality of a generation. Also, when you take Mega Evolutions and the Lowland forms into account, the number of new designs is more or less on par with the other generations. As a result, the series has found itself in a weird place. If you're interested in catching new Pokemon, then there hasn't really been a game for you in almost a decade. Because people kept complaining about Black and White for not having their old favorites. It's the fandom's fault in that regard. I mean, all you do is complaining about the new Pokemon design, so are you sure that you really want more? The more you add to the game, the more you have to balance around. Not only stats and move codes, but also where and when you can encounter them in the game. You don't want to overwhelm the player with way too many Pokemon at once. You can do it like in black and white, and make it impossible for the player to catch any of the older Pokemon until you beat the league. And nobody likes that. When you deal with over 800 of them, it is better to create a good mix out of old and new. And if you're interested in playing competitively, then you're better off not buying the game. So listen up, Reggie. Here's what I need from you for Sword and Shield. More new Pokemans, make EV training and breeding less shitty, a cooler user interface. Let people transfer Pokemon from the games into Pokemon Go like a Pokewalker. Maybe add that manual Pokeball throwing thing into the main series while you're at it. Let your Pokemon follow you around. Okay, let's take a look at this. More Pokemon. People will bitch about there being too many uncreative Pokemon. Make Eevees and Ivies less awful. They've already done that. B Persona 5, you are comparing apples and oranges here. Pokemon Go equals Pokewalker. I mean, for starters, Pokemon Go only includes Gen 1 to Gen 4 at the time of writing this video, so unless you want to limit it to older generations, I think that's not gonna happen. Let me throw shit. Well, you can do it in Let's Go, so there's a chance that they will include it in Cheat and Sword as well, but they better don't make it mandatory like in Let's Go, cause people didn't like that. Pokemon Walkies. It's a feature that comes and goes, and yeah, I think it's an feature, but frankly it's a bit of a petty complaint to have. Honestly, while I do agree that there are a lot of issues with Pokemon franchise, a lot of the issues brought up here were already been addressed in a more simple fashion by the games, or are things that would require a lot more work than what would be allowed a time that are completely subjective. Honestly, while I do agree that there are a lot of issues with the main series of Pokemon, or are things that would take a lot more work to do, or are things that are completely subjective, like with throwing of the Pokeballs. You don't really want to mess too much with the core game here of Pokemon. People like the turn-based combat. You can see how many people complained about the changes to Let's Go Eevee and Pikachu when all the dead was to replace fights against wild Pokemon with Pokemon Go catching mechanic. Doing the menus more in the Persona style is rather unnecessary and I think the more simple approach Pokemon is using is intentional. Now I do think there are ways to mix up Pokemon. Maybe reworking the move pool and adding new status effects or adjustable difficulty levels, cause I think the idea of a hard mode is rather tempting or maybe a more engaging story. Of course we cannot say how the story of Shield and Sword will turn out. Like I said, there are issues with Pokemon games, but most of the issues in this video were already addressed and fixed way before the creation of it, and it's baffling to me that you'd ignore those changes just to make your points. Pokemon can do better, but we need to highlight when they do good stuff too. They need to go back to the formula for black and white. You know it's forbidden to actually like those games in the Pokemon community. Forbidden? Really? Yeah, it's one of Arceus' Ten Commandments. Number 5. You shall not like the 5th generation. That's just... Yeah!